This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Eileen Katz, Comedy Central's head of programming at the time. And I thought in the first five minutes that they were going to strangle him. The first thing Craig said was, Some of you guys worked at MTV? And Eileen and I had come from there originally. Yes, why? Craig goes, Do you know downtown Julie Brown? We go, Yeah, sure. He goes, Because I love brown sugar. That's how the meeting started. Craig actually managed to bring it all the way around, and by the time the meeting was over, they were like, That's our guy. Writers were hired. J.R. Havlin, Tom Johnson, Ray James, Kent Jones, and Guy Nicolucci, as were the first batch of correspondents, A. Whitney Brown, Beth Littleford, and Brian Unger, plus Winstead. Louis Black, a dyspeptic stand-up, came on as an Andy Rooney-type commentator who would deliver rants pegged to wacky news video clips. But as the program's debut date closed in, no one could come up with a suitable name. Until one day, Smithberg called Herzog. Why don't we just call it The Daily Show? It premiered on July 22, 1996 at 11.30 p.m. The format loosely tracked that of a conventional newscast. Five or so opening minutes called Headlines, read by Kilbourne from the anchor desk, followed by Other News, then usually a pre-taped field piece with one of the correspondents, and finishing up with Kilbourne interviewing an actor or a musician promoting their new movie or TV show or album. Some segments played off the hard news of the day, like the presidential contest between Bob Dole and Bill Clinton. There was more of a pop culture and lifestyle component only because what we were satirizing, particularly local news, was doing a lot of that stuff, Winstead says. We would make fun of the conventions of news, like when TV reporters talk, how do you create drama in a story that doesn't exist? Brian Unger, who had been a producer at CBS News, invented what it means to be a daily show correspondent. Yet the tone of Kilbourne's daily show could be mean-spirited. A headline called, Operation Desert Shield Me from Impeachment, included a joke that investigators were having trouble analyzing the stain on Monica Lewinsky's dress because it was mixed with liver-flavored Alpo. Field pieces often centered on true believers in UFOs and aliens. The day-to-day -day creative process of the first few years of The Daily Show centered on Smithberg, Winstead, and the writing staff, which now included Paul Mercurio, Jim Earle, and Steve Rosenfield. My first day on the job, Winstead says, I have to pull the writers into my office and say, Guys, you can't have your mushroom dealer come up to the office. Kilbourne came up with the signature five questions conceit for guest interviews, but otherwise largely read from the script. In November 1996, after Bill Maher's exit, Comedy Central's executives moved The Daily Show to 11 p.m., in part to counter-program the late local news, and in part because they knew their low-budget operation had no real hope of competing with the late-night mainstream comedy powerhouses. The war between David Letterman and Jay Leno to succeed Johnny Carson at the helm of The Tonight Show had been national front-page news in 1992 and 1993, and Comedy Central was available in fewer than half of American households. Leno took over the flagship NBC show, but Letterman's new Late Show on CBS was scoring high ratings, too. Each attracted around 6 million viewers per night. Kilbourne's Daily Show would peak at a nightly average of 357,000. Yet Kilbourne's audience was growing, and the show was generating critical buzz, helped by the addition of correspondents Mo Rocha and Stephen Colbert. Perhaps more important than the chatter was the fact that the Daily Show audience was indeed reaching the younger male viewers Herzog had targeted in the first place. The combination caught Letterman's eye, and in 1998, CBS offered Kilbourne its 12.30 a.m. late late show slot. He starts to get a little heat. We're starting to get a little attention with The Daily Show, Herzog says. And then the next thing you know, Kilbourne goes and signs with CBS without even telling us. Panic followed by auditions. David Allen Greer, Michael McKean, Greg Proops, Bill Weir, and Mike Rowe came to The Daily Show studio and sat in the host's chair. Littleford and Colbert got tryouts, too. 
But Herzog and other Comedy Central executives wondered about a guy who had hosted the short-lived MTV talk show produced by Smithberg, a black leather jacket-wearing stand-up comic. He had lost out to Conan O'Brien as Letterman's NBC replacement. He had written.